right, so I guess we'll get started here. Um, everyone, thanks for coming to the meeting. This is kind of the, the fancy residence hall history one. Um, we have tea in the back that you guys can grab. Everyone should be getting one or two. I think we have enough for two while supplies last. So these 1943 World War II steel pennies. Um, so they're made out of steel due to metal shortages caused by World War II. And um, they found that these would rust, so a lot of them were actually collected back by the mint and destroyed. Um, and in subsequent years during the war, they used shell casings of bullets to make pennies. So after 1943, those are also kind of cool pennies to find um, for the wartime ones. But anyways, I'll get started on uh, the real meat and potatoes of our presentation. Starting out with the School of Engineering, now I'm going all the way back to basically 1903. Oscar Werwath starts the Milwaukee School of Engineering. And when we start, we're really more of a tech college or a trade school. Um, there was engineering curriculum, but a lot of this was considered practical electronics. And really it started as like an electrical engineering uh, school. Um, but as our reputation grew and as we had more people interested in the technical side of things, uh, from an engineering standpoint, um, we fleshed out our, our university really to become more of like an engineering university than a tech college. And that's when you start to see um, people coming in from further away, um, even other countries, and people who are looking to live in the area and attend school instead of commuting to classes and a lot of the early courses were also night classes, and that kind of factored into, you know, people weren't living on campus, they were commuting in, sometimes after work, um, and gaining these technical skills. So, the beginning of the whole residence hall history at MSOE uh, goes with Carl Werwath and uh, his younger brother, Heinz, who were both sons of Oscar Werwath, the founder of MSOE. Um, Carl Werwath had a vision for a MSOE technology park where we would have many buildings um, that did not exist when he came in as president after his father. Um, and he really saw MSOE becoming more like a larger school where you have things like residence halls and you have buildings for different departments. Um, can, can I add something? Sure. A lot of people wonder where did MSOE students live before MSOE actually had its own residence halls. And most of the students who attended MSOE lived in the area, but this area of town was in the factory and kind of the red light district of town, so there were a lot of rooming houses in the area, and people would just kind of like find a whole bunch of apartments. But they were not as nice as the ones that are now to the east of campus. So a lot of students uh, lived nearby. And also, after World War II, a lot of people were getting into the trades, right? So a lot of soldiers were coming back from the war. They would get the GI Bill and then have a chance to go to school. So MSOE had a lot of veterans. They were living in the area, living on their own. And then they would live in the area and MSOE would have those students. <coughs> Adding to that, a lot of our students you mentioned were nighttime students. During the day, they worked in the factory, such as what was considered Rockwell now, or Alan Bradley, Alice Chalmers. And they worked in the line, and then that paid for their tuition because the company said, we'll hire you, and at night send you to become a better engineer to help us in our company. So there's original photos in the, in the two history books, our 75th and our 100th, that walk you through that. There's, there's one other thing to remember, and that is that remember that engineers get a professional uh, you know, diploma, so you become a professional engineer. So the path to becoming a professional engineer could easily go through a trade school like MSOE or through practical college. So before we were a university, it was not unusual for that to be the path that people became a professional engineer. And now we're never going to get off this first picture, but I'm going to tell you one more thing. <laughs> <laughs> the three people there are all buried in the same site, right, along with all the other war west. And it's located on 27th and Forest Home in the Forest, uh, Forest, Forest Home Cemetery. And under on their graveyard, their family gravestone or anything, there's not a single mention of MSOE. You know, yet uh, they were vice presidents and presidents and treasurer and everything of this. And um, nobody really maintains it, 
So myself and some students periodically will go out there and you know s scrub down the marble stone and and plant some flowers or do something like that. So that like great if that's something that the historical system. group right, but it's also cool. one of those things that'd be cool is if the group ever reached out to the family and said, "Would you allow us to add on a small little plaque that indicates that these are the founders of MSU?" Because MSU was not just a tech school anymore, you know. Um, but you know, and maybe work with marketing to see if they'd ever do that. But it's one of those things that's kind of like you don't see the Werwolf name much on this campus except in the Werwolf Mall, you know, um, and that was it. So it's kind of like they were here, but then moved on. And by the way, they also owned a bunch of the rooming houses in the area, oh. and so <laughs> they uh, rented it to MSU students. But that's the start of really sure. residence halls is that they own the buildings that students were living in. Sure. <laughs> all our students, all, all our stories come back around in a circle. So it's like, yeah. yeah. We're on topic, even though it doesn't seem like it. All right, so then I'll start with some of Rick's photos that he dug up. But before you show that picture, did you see the picture of what it looked like prior to that? No. So okay, can you can you sure. open up uh, Facebook at the same time? Sorry guys, be just a second. Go to see all. Go down a little ways. Go to the uh, keep going down right there. Where is this whole throwback Thursday? Go down. Keep going down. Keep going down. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Uh, keep going. Oh, keep going. Oh, keep going. Right there on the left. So a couple of years back, the Milwaukee County Historical Society put a picture like this up and then said, oh, this has now been replaced by the residence halls. Do you know what I mean? RWJ. And then all these people would comment on their site and make a comment like, oh, that's so sad that they lost this beautiful mansion to put up a dumpy looking residence hall. You know, that kind of stuff. Oh, if only people cared about history. Now, that's what it was like when it was built. Now I'll show them the picture it was like when MS bought it. And that goes back to your picture. picture. No, 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 no
right? And the school would not sell to us, but then it mysteriously burnt down a year later and we got the property. You know? <laughs> so, thing. but along that, I'm not sure if it's still there, but along that fence, it has a plaque for it. You know, that's where, that's where, that, where that driveway down is, that would be right at the corner, you know, kind of where they, the stairs are. And where that other building is that goes over that walkway, that would be where the, the new softball stadium is facing towards what would be the tall building. The tall building would be the outfield of the softball field. And I'm not sure if they changed the fence along Milwaukee Street on the athletic field or if it's the same fence. But if it is, there's an old MSUE sign on it. And one of the things it says, there's no basketball playing allowed while a softball game is in session. And you look at you go, what does that mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? And it was because there used to be basketball courts there at the same time. We just never took down the sign. You know. So if it's still there, it's kinda cool. You know. Which I think you guys like. should be rebels. Take a basketball and go <laughs> And go like, I'm gonna watch a softball <laughs> game <laughs> and public safety will come up here and be like, That's it, you're out of here. <laughs>25 years we have a couple different aldermen that controlled uh, this area for Milwaukee and an alderman before the current alderman we have his name was Henningsen and he hated that history. He just hated us. He hated Dr. Beats. He did. And he had long hair. He's a hippie guy from the 60s. Right? Really, we're talking long hair, you know, to, toward his ass, you know. <laughs> and But he hated us. So anytime he could rip on MS3 he would, right? But then he finally faced a tough re-election. And he had to meet with Dr. Beats to get students to vote. And he made a deal with Dr. Beats, and he said to Dr. Beats, he goes, we will let you build the Kern Center, right? And I'll sell you that property because the city owned the property that the Kern Center was on, because it was underneath the freeway. And said, but you have to turn out 200 voters from the... No, no you're right, you're right. You're 200 right. Right. voters right. from the right. residence halls, you right. know, to vote. Now, at the time, we had about maybe 850 people in the residence hall, so it's higher now with the beats. How many voters do you think, on average, voted out of the residence halls out of those 800? 20. Seven. Oh, <laughs> right. So he calls Nick and I up, and the other one goes, you guys need to get 200 students to vote. You know what I mean? Really, Otherwise, we're not going to get the current center. We're like, what the hell? You know what I mean? <laughs> and... <laughs> but in Wisconsin, you can't spend more than one dollar to convince a, a person to vote. You can't to do that. So we bribed them with slices of pizza, donuts. We so said we'll give you a ride from, you know, hopping to Red Band. You get a free donut and a soda because if you could ride. Students wanted the current center. They knew that it mattered, right? right? And, and we didn't bribe the students, but Rick contacted the the, <laughs> the state election called? commission. State we said, can we do this? And you know, the guy goes. My nephew went to MSUE. I'm sure you, one of your engineers can figure out some numerical equation to make it look like it was only a dollar spent. <laughs> <laughs> and then that was hilarious. I'm like, ah, that's how the law works, you know? Yeah. But anyways. What, what, what they eventually said was, 
if you gave something away and people had a chance to win it, like a pizza party for a floor, and the pizza party was $100, right? But over 100 people participated in that contest, then you spent less than $1 to try to get one person to vote, right? And the reason we're mentioning anything. that, because any improvement we ever did on campus had to get the alderman's approval. Well, the alderman ended up winning by 223 votes. So we turned it out. The church was really upset because the church wanted that property, right? <laughs> but we got it. Well, so just, it, was, you know, it, was, it was before Grace Place was built, yeah. and the church said that they had the money to build to the north, which would have been where your current center is, right? And the truth is that the church didn't have the money. They were kind of playing some games and stuff like that. And they eventually did build the Grace Place, but they built it west, right? Um, what Rick said about, like, the alderman won by 250 votes, he did. But we got over 500 students to vote. Right. So if we would have only got him or helped him, you know, encourage students to vote, if we would have only got the 200 needed, he would have still lost. Right. But now, the neat thing the about that whole thing, we got the property and everything, and uh, the alderman was a great alderman, then loved them as but unfortunately, he got busted about a year later for extortion. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then went to prison. <laughs> but he was a super nice guy. But anyway, just wanted to show this. There's always these little twists about the story. Yeah. Keep going now. Sorry. All right, so then. Uh... Go to the groundbreaking, and there they have a more accurate picture of what they were putting together on the sign. Um, the people in the picture are Roy W. Johnson and the then student government president, um, breaking ground for the first residence hall on campus. Guy, anybody know the guy in the far right? With his hands clasped in front of him? That's Henry Meyer, Henry Meyer Festival Park. That was the mayor at that time. And whatever Mayor Meyer said, he was a cigar smoking guy, whatever he said, did. And he was like Milwaukee's mayor for like 30, 34 years? About that. Like that. Yeah. Milwaukee mayors have never been defeated for re-election. They only retire or uh, resign because of affairs and violations of the rules. You know what I mean? <laughs> but they never get defeated, right? Roy W. Johnson, we have never, archives looked, marketing looked, everybody looked, nobody knows what the W stands for, right? <laughs> we found nothing. We found the checks that he wrote. We found all this stuff. Everything's just W. All we know is that he was associated with the Singer Sewing Machine Company. That's all we know. You know what I mean? As to where he might have got his money from, but we've never figured out what the W, the plaques, AW, every email from him, or not email, it was not that, <laughs> but anyway, all that kind of stuff said W, just so you know. So we just thought we'd tell you that yeah. story. Yeah. There's the uh, foundation getting laid for the building. Not much to point out, I guess. But here it is. Um, there's the first floor is kind of coming up. Who, hold on one second. Yep, we gotta talk there. about these buildings for a second. Yep. On the left side. Yep. Nick will tell me the first one, I'll tell the second one. So the, the the first building, which is the taller, bigger one? No, that's mine. Oh, that's the one. You're the little one. Is that the first one? That one. The first one. For fuck's sake. Okay, so. Yeah, so the first one. First one. One. Okay, so <laughs> he swears more than I do. <laughs> so the smaller building that's kind of tilted and, you know, has the gable on the top of it was, I believe it was called the E building. It was a temporary building that was there. And that's where they had built like temporary classrooms. Um, it was there for kind of like a long time. I think it got torn down right around like 1972, 73, somewhere right in there. So it was it, that was like the main classroom building for MSOE for a while, and I, which is kind of funny because you're looking at it and it's not a very big building, right? But it would kind of be the equivalent of the third floor of this building, right? where the math classes were held, where like, uh, you know, the general like physics or whatever, where you just need a room in order to be able to do the class. So I, I think it was called the E building, but yeah, uh, that's that's what that building We're was. We're created so. with our building names. We had the B building, the E building, the C building, et cetera. You know, I think they're named after the letters that you guys got, but, you know, <laughs> but the, uh, the C building, which uh -huh. was the one that says Boston School of Engineering and the black plaque on the side was 1025 North Milwaukee. 
So all our old stationery and stuff said MSOE 1025 North Milwaukee. When we got the Campus Center building, which is our main address now, it was 1025 North Broadway. You know, so it's still 1025. But we'll show you the pictures of that building later yeah. on, and, and it's kind of cool. And Dirks Hall is now 1025 North Milwaukee Street, so it holds the same address, which is kind of interesting. That's where Dirks. Yes. Hall. One one other funny story about that. Rick did talk about that earlier about where we went in and looked in that building. Uh, when when they moved people out of that building in 1990, they literally came in one day and said, "You have two days to move. Grab your stuff. You guys are going over to." the campus center building. So for a long time, you could go into that building and walk around and actually still find files on desks and stuff like that. Where people had just picked up stuff. On the way out, everybody had signed a wall, so one of the walls had a whole bunch of signatures on it and stuff. And it's also interesting because, like, the train club uh, was in there and had a, a space. There used to be a swimming pool in the basement of that. So, like, when there's a joke, like, do you know where the swimming pool is on campus, right? We actually kind of had one, but it kind of was dilapidated from the time we first got it. And they it. built their train display inside the swimming pool. Yep. So, and, and then one, one of my favorite stories about that was when I was in the admissions office in 1997, I was told to go over there. We used to store our, our, our uh, extra envelopes and stuff in there. Like literally like, oh, we, we'll just use that as empty space. And I was like, wow, I'm in this building. I'm going to totally like explore it. Some. And when you would go up to the second or third floor, there were actually holes in the floor. So, like, you could fall through and fucking kill yourself, right? It was not good. But I remember I went in the basement, and we were told that every now and then vagrants would, like, break into that space so they had a place to sleep. And so I was walking through the building, and I was walking, and I turned, and somebody turned right and looked directly at me. And I was like, holy crap. And it turned out it was a full-length mirror. And I heard it was me that had turned and, and faced myself. And I was like, holy crap, that was horrible. Okay, so anyway, I got over it, and then we left. But we'll have you out of here by 10. Yeah, right. okay, yep. yeah, no worries. All right, keep going. Sorry. Yep. All right. There, we're starting to see a uh, building taking shape, you know. So who was Roy W. Johnson? I guess we kind of touched on this. Um, he was the chairman of the board of the Controls Company of America, which was bought out by the Singer Sewing Machine Company. And uh, he was a longtime member of the MSOE Board of Regents, and he was a pioneer in the refrigeration and air conditioning controls industry. So there he is, and I think Fred Look is behind him in that picture. Kind of a, a fun story about that plaque. That plaque used to be inside the front door just to the left, uh, just after the public safety space, when people would go into a, uh, RWJ uh, at that time. Does anybody know where it is now? Neither do we. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we, we're not sure where the plaque is, but there's a funny story about the plaque. Uh, you, you'd be walking in kind of like where the, the elevators are, right? So like we open those doors for move-in. That's where that space would have been just to the left of those doors when you move in. But uh, we one time had the family of Roy W. Johnson come and visit MSOE. And they're like, there's a plaque in here. We know the building's been dedicated to him and nobody could find the plaque. We put a soda machine in front of it. <laughs> so just fun story. Yeah. Kind of yeah, that was a tough one. So the building was completed. This was the lobby of it. You can see the black there, piano, um, chairs, I guess, randomly thrown in. This was the cafeteria when the building first opened. You can see the kind of Ruby globe lighting there. And, and that would be the equivalent of a cove. So if you guys are thinking, like, what space is this? This would be walking back to the cove. Big line by the door. I, I remember that. Uh, I had that when I was there. <laughs> um, this is a room when it, like, right when construction finished. And you'll notice there's no sprinkler pipe here. 
And I don't know if that's because it wasn't required or if they just never put it in. It was, it was not required and they added the sprinklers in like 2007 when a law was passed. We only cared about you very recently. Yeah. <laughs> But other than that, the furniture looks kind of the same as MLH. Those, the beds, right during the day, they're couches, and at night they would pull out, and that's how you had your beds. But think about it, when you pull those beds out, you were like this, hey, Rumi. You know what I mean? Because you were like right next to the person. Yeah. You know. And did you say that when you bolted furniture to the wall, you got like a tax credit? So. <laughs> you could, on your bond, whatever was attached to the wall, right was part of the bond so you didn't have to raise separate funds for that so the desks were attached the cabinets were attached those were attached as long as attached the only thing basically MSV we had to pay for out of pocket was for the beds yeah you know we still use the same beds and <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't doubt but, but we do use some of the same desks and some of the same yeah. cabinets yeah. 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 if you're in mlh you'll know those yeah, ones so yeah very historic yeah I love that radio on the car. You know, can I comment here real sure. quick? Yeah. So this was the entrance of Roy W. Johnson, right? But he noticed all those lights, right? Well, the problem with those lights was in downtown with the river spiders, those things would fill up with tons of spiders and bugs, right? So they eventually took all those lights out and they just sealed them with cement. So for years you'd come in and be like, why are these all these sealed circles in the ceiling? Because those would be the lights, but as people walked in, all these bugs would drop on them <laughs> and stuff. It was yeah, absolutely like, disgusting. You know how like moths look for light? It right. would just be like a swarm of bugs. Yeah, and then the spiders. And so you get that outside the campus center building doors sometime, if you ever notice, and you're like, holy shit, you know. And, but imagine every time you came home from Memphis where you're like, Man, this is just terrible. You're fighting all these animals and stuff like There's that. There's an interesting fact about that uh, MSOE, uh, Roy W. Johnson Residence Hall 1965 sign. In this picture, it's to the right of the doors. Later, they took out those concrete benches and they actually moved that sign to the far left-hand side of the door. And that, that was thought to have been done when they started doing the expansion for Regents because they then needed to you know, make sure the construction can move through that space. So, and you'll see that on the right-hand picture, MLH does not yet exist, so. Yeah, and I guess uh, one last thing is when you walk on the sidewalk by Beats Tower now, you'll see that there are two lumps of like minerals on the sidewalk and that's just from all the rain over the years coming off the overhang onto the sidewalk. So <laughs> that's still there. This is, um, you know, 1967, um, RWJ is open, uh, MLH might be open, but um, just looking at what people are saying, um, did you enjoy supper? It wasn't bad, I ate at the morgue. Um, people are talking crap about the dorms and <laughs> the cafeteria from the day that they opened. And so it's nothing new. Um, and, and just as a side note, yeah. that happens at every college, right? Yeah. So like, that's the way it is. On Sunday nights, they, Jim McIntyre used to be the director of policy, and he was a colonel. And on Sunday nights, the men would have to come down with ties, dress shirts and ties on for dinner. And so Sunday nights, it was always required that you had to be in a formal work dress. A woman did not have to. You know why? There were none! <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so it's going again? Yeah. Alright, so I'll move on to the next one here. Wow, that's like really sensitive. Okay, so 1969, um, I think I looped back to MLH for some reason after this. Um, right when RWJ is done, they start talking about we want to have a radio station on campus. And this really was published in the student paper in 66 becomes an actual thing in 69, um, but very early on they say, you know, we, we should have a radio station because they're very technically minded people, and um, that's kind of what they did. And the early w WSOE was actually an AM station where they ran the, uh, the signal through the power lines of the dorm. Um, so you would plug a radio in and you could pick it up, but if you were, you know, 
a quarter mile away, you wouldn't pick up our station because it was only in the building itself. And then eventually that grew into WMSE with an actual transmitter. Um, and it looks like they dabbled in TV for a bit, but it was mainly AM and then we switched over to FM when the Student Broadcasting Club uh, started up. And this was kind of a, a cartoon that they put out in the student newspaper when they finally got approved for their student broadcasting club is that MSOE gave them the funding and they said, all right, build all this equipment. Um, and then they actually started transmitting and MSOE said, well, hey, wait, we didn't get permission for that yet. So they said, well, you gave us everything up to this point and nobody stopped them until then. But then they had to deal with all the legal stuff before they could actually transmit. All right, so this is laying the foundation for MLH. You can kind of see the house behind it. Um, there were two houses that got demolished in the process of building MLH. One of them was a MSOE fraternity house, and the other was, I believe, an unrelated coach house. And um, it was built from November 66 and completed in September 67. So a very tight timetable on the construction of MLH. And Cafe to Kappa was here up until maybe 2010? Nope. That sounds about right. Yeah. yeah. All right. This is the dedication. Um, so Margaret Luck was not alive at this, at this point, maybe? We, no. We, no. We, don't, we don't think so. Oh, okay. so. What's yeah. kind of weird is that there's a plaque. So this building opened in like... 60 something, right? 67. 67, and there's a plaque that it's that photo yeah. with a plaque underneath it that says 1974. Okay, so I think Margaret might have. So she died. might have been alive, and maybe that's the day that she passed, but we're not, <laughs> we, nobody explains what the date is. So yeah. if you guys ever date anything, explain what the date is for anybody, okay? Yeah. So, like, if you do that, like. Just, you know, the archives has the checks that. Uh, MLH or that uh, uh, the Look family wrote for the naming rights, right? So they had paid for the naming rights for our science building, and without asking them, uh, you know, for a donation for the naming rights, they just named it after Margaret Look and thought that the Look family would just be thank you. And by the way, here's another big check, and I think the check was only for something like twelve hundred dollars. Do you know what I mean? It was like the smallest amount you can imagine. But we still had the original checks, you know, back in our archives. You know, but I want to share that. Now, you know they used to also say public safety was on the side of the building? Right? They couldn't wait to get rid of the public safety name. You know why? Because the students kept stealing the L. Oh yeah, <laughs> and so it was it was constantly stolen, nice. and so then people would be, like, would be lit up, and people would be driving down the street going, "What?" You know what I mean? And, uh, and, and you, I believe that this picture of of MLH is taken from the twelfth floor, so you can still see like out out the the window. Uh, yeah. That's pretty high up, and was pretty kind of cool. Yeah. And when they finished the 12th floor, it was, you know, they knew that they would have these bigger rooms for activities and, you know, there was the kitchen up there and the big lounge area. So even when they announced that the building was being built, they kind of laid out exactly how the 12th floor would look. And an interesting thing I have here, Nick also has some of this, but I found a wad of newspaper from September 1967 in the cinder block walls of my dorm room when I was cleaning it. So we can pass this around and people can check it out. But there's way more of it than that. I just framed these interesting articles. If you get a chance, remind me, we have like, I think newspapers from the 1920s, 1930s, and 40s. Oh, that chemistry student groups wrote out. Yeah, up in our storage. and. and uh, Really? Then I'll give it to you. We just, <laughs> they just said it's storage because I had no idea what to ever do with them. And it doesn't tell now when you told me that, that I thought, oh, yeah. we'll give them to you guys. Okay. They were called the Currents, you know, was one of the names yeah. of the student newspaper and stuff. But you want to keep going? Sure. Yeah. There, there we go. All right. So this is the two buildings <laughs> that are completed. Um, so you can see we used to have our bookstore in that church, and um, there's the C building. 
the temporary building, RWJ and MLH, and that's on um, Milwaukee Street. Um, and then this here is just the two buildings, you know, you can kind of see them better when they were brand new. So they look pretty similar today. Before you move on, sure. you can see over there, there's the church. And oh my gosh, I'm about to sneeze. The church, <laughs> excuse me. <clears throat> the church was at the Swedes bookstore for a while. So um, it had been a church, they used it as a bookstore so students would go actually in there and get their stuff. And then you can see that there was one other building between the C building and the church itself. And then that's, of course, uh, Dirks Hall and, and the parking lot for Roman Tower. So. And there's a little plaque from the old church on the wall along the Roman garage. You'll see that. So um, the minute that the residence hall is open, the Residence Life Department is founded, and it's always been called the MSOE Residence Life Department. Um, and then very quickly after the residence halls opened, we saw RHA start up. Um, so. Moving along a little bit in history, um, Ken McAteer was brought in. Um, so I don't know a ton about the people who were in charge of the department before Ken McAteer, but he was really brought in when we were in a time of dire need. Um, our residence hall occupancy reached 60%. Um, so MSOE briefly considered selling MLH. And I don't know who would buy MLH <laughs> because it's not a great you know, place to get an apartment or something. It's really a dorm. Um, but we were thinking like, man, we can't fill these up. People aren't staying in them. So in 1973, we brought in Ken McAteer. Um, he brought in some changes. Um, he brought uh, single rooms for juniors and seniors that was offered to them. Um, the Residence Hall Association had existed already by this point, but he put more money into it and he made sure that they were running events and bringing a social life to the residence halls. Yeah, he introduced the Pals Place Bar, which I covered later, and um, under his direction, the housing at MSOE returned to full capacity by the mid-1970s. Ken McAteer is still alive. He was a Colonel McAteer and he later ran the Career Services Office. All right, so in 1973 with Ken McAteer, we also saw two floors in our residence halls uh, occupied by women, which was the first time they did that. So with the Pals Place Bar, this opened in the basement of RWJ, Roy W. Johnson Residence Hall, in 1975. Um, back then it was a popular gathering place for students and it did serve beer. Um, so students from nearby colleges and universities would also come to Pals Place. Um, and there was a game room that was adjacent to the bar where RHA would generate income um, from charging money for the games. Um, if, if you go into the bottom of uh, the old RWJ, aka Beats Tower, there's a space that's really only accessible by uh, facilities and custodial staff. But if you go into one of the furniture storage rooms, you can still see the wooden parts, the wooden, like, uh, like basically like fake wooden log stuff. The really like popular style for like game room type things were in sort of that like rustic wooden like style. And UWM at the same time had a space called the Gas House. So like that's which I think is still there. I don't know if it's been renamed, but like uh, that ha that kind of had that old like wooden benches, wooden like boots and stuff like that. And some of that wood is still intact in that space. So yeah, that is true. I've seen it. I can confirm. Um, Mary Meserly was the next director of housing for the early 1980s. Um, she was surprisingly open to students' ideas. So some students came up with a petition where they were not happy with food and the conditions in the halls, and they started a petition. And she offered for them to come to her office and rip up their contracts. <laughs> um, and she's still alive as well doing uh, different things for ladies in college. Oh. 
under her, you know, administration of being the director, the sixth floor of MLH decided that they were not happy with the contracted cleaning services that were being provided to them. So they set up a system where they cleaned their own floor and everyone volunteered and rotated shifts. Um, so this was the only floor that did that, but that was kind of an interesting thing that happened. Yeah. He and Jenny and Mozanis was a student newspaper for a long time. Mm -hmm. Kind of like it circles back currently, it's the MSOE Groman Tower student <laughs> yeah. workers that are cleaning the residence all We're back to that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs>
they're actually doors. Only when they did the most recent facing renovation did that change, like only like two years ago. Yeah. And in the beginning, when we first started, yeah. they did they drywalled it later, but it just had chains on it. Yeah. <laughs> See what I mean? So you can still open it up and look down like about three or four inches. Inch, like, yeah. you, know, an inch. <laughs> you know, and one of the reasons that that did not get built was because the old German English Academy. MSOE sold the German English Academy in a trade with the city for the grass athletic field. Remember how Rick yep. talked earlier about how there was a school there and then it burned down? Well, that empty lot then was available. MSOE wanted to buy it. So we traded the now dilapidated German English Academy building, which I think was called the B building. Uh, and that building uh, got bought and we traded it to the city. The city sold it to a uh, uh, different group who developed it and then when we proposed this walkway uh, they said it would ruin their view of Broadway if we built that you know because a lot of people are looking out those like crappy windows and uh, since then of course that property has come back into possession of MSOE right so like the uh, what do you call it the innovation center for uh, direct supply is in that space, and MSOE owns that building again, but the, the plans for the Skywalker, of course, long gone. Can you do that again? We cut down on the elevator traffic up to the third floor. Yeah, yeah that's that's like the only time, <laughs> nine percent of all ele elevator traffic. And, you know, after that, we see our third residence hall on campus, Regents Hall, um, built in 1990. Um, the rooms in there, if you've ever been in there, they're suite-style rooms. So usually you have multiple people in one suite. They share a common area, and then there's kind of rooms that they can be in. They have their own bathrooms. Um, they a little kitchenette, kind of. Um, and the idea is that this was originally going to be co-ed. Maybe you'd have like married couples or you'd just have a mixture of people in there. But now it's all women, you know. Oh, that was MSOE being super progressive and finally allowing co-ed, potentially co-ed living space. Um, but what's also interesting about that is that when they first built that, there was thought that MSOE might be able to build higher on top of Regents that it could possibly be expanded, but it turns out that when they built it, um, you could not expand upward on that space. And so there was a consideration to try to build upward on that, like in the mid-2010s, um, but we, uh, upon, you know, testing it and checking it, like, nope, it was just built the way it was, so, um, so we didn't do that, but it was a new apartment complex in the world, so. All right, next guy, Bill Brees. Maybe we just one after the other of people in this department. But he was the director of housing from 98 to 2017. We pulled him in from Kohl's Corporate to run our bookstore because we wanted the bookstore to be more of like a merchandise shopping area. At the time, it was really mostly textbooks. Um, and so he was put in after Owen Cherry retired. Within Roscoe's, we, or within Regions, we have Roscoe's, which was originally called American Pie and then rebranded to Roscoe's. But throughout its whole life, it was kind of a place where people would go in at night and grab snacks and things, um, fried foods, mozzi sticks, uh, fries, hamburgers. Um, you could get smoothies. This is within you know my time here. It's uh, too sad to see. Oh it was, it you was, recognize those tables? Yeah. 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 It, it was American Pie P.I. You know, kind of like mm -hmm. after the oh, song, yeah. American yeah. Pie, but with uh, like engineering, you know. People. Mm -hmm. You guys know Miguel who works over the cafeteria. Yeah. Right? He ran it. Yeah. yeah. Um. This is the RWJ cafeteria in the 90s. And the only reason I have this here is you'll see the soda fountain is red. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> it's been a while since we've had that on campus, but we had Coca-Cola in our 
cafeteria. And also there's the ice cream machine that we had up until the cafeteria closed. There's Bill Brees uh, and uh, Cheryl Crawford and the 1997 RHA Executive Board. In the Canvas Center, you could also get food with a MSOE meal plan from the Skylight Deli. Um, so you would go out to the CC Freight Room, which was a lot bigger before it was renovated. And um, you could go to all the different seating. And this is only a portion of the seating backed by career services. I mean, the whole floor was basically chairs and tables. Where Next, career services is now is, is not there anymore. It slid over to that used to be the registrar's office. Yeah, so. the, the sky that, the, that you see on the left would have been oh. sort of where you can get your like deli stuff and desserts. And then on the left, on the you know, when you walk into the eatery on the left-hand side was this very large open area. That walkway on the top floor is still there. You know, the stairs loop around, but it's now, like, blocked off. And uh, another thing that's interesting about this, that photo is from 2003, and you can tell because the MSOE 100-year banner is hanging up there, which was stolen yeah. by a student group, and nobody knew where it went. We never got it back. So somebody has the MSOE 100-year banner. That thing was huge. Somewhere. It was, like... And no exaggeration, like the size of these tables. It was, I don't know who has it, but, or what they would do with it if it was big. Yeah. Um, and I guess something to mention about Roscoe's and Skylight is that before you had our unlimited meal plan today, you had a fixed number of meal swipes that you would purchase at the beginning of the term, as well as Raider dollars. Um, so you could get uh, your swipe at the cafeteria, which is what most people did because it was unlimited food. Or you could go to Skylight and either pay money for food or use one meal swipe and you would get a drink, a uh, main course and a side. Um, and then Roscoe's also had it where you would do some kind of complicated conversion of swipes. It's a director of housing. Appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it was just a complicated system. Like that. So the unlimited meal plan system now, I would say, is a lot better. I mean, with the old system, people ran out of meal swipes, and then you'd have to do funky stuff with little thing in there. If you look where the stairs go down by the flags, and by the way, the flags represented where all we had students from uh, who went to school. Our, our international students. Right. So. But if you looked at those garbage cans, the student group wanted to do recycling in the building. And they would put all these different things, paper, whatever. And then at night, you started to come by and put all the trash together in the same bag. You know? <laughs> <laughs> These would be totally funny. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so we still struggle with recycling that camp. There is something else worth mentioning with, like, the Raider dollars. <laughs> uh, we never got to do it, but, um, like, people that bought, that had too many Raider dollars at the end, like, it all oh, yeah. would be wiped out yeah. by the next year. So people would stock up on, like... Snacks. You would go to Roscoe's and just grab everything. Yeah, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but we never got to sold. have like the spring thing where like everyone just like That's poured true. as much yeah. as possible. But every year Roscoe would just get slammed with people buying stuff. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of an interesting photo. Of how <laughs> somebody built a double decker door in their room. Um, so that's what that is. Um, I can and talk about that. Sure. Yeah. Too. I, I don't know who, whose that was. It was in in like 2005 or six. MSOE had a bed bug problem. So uh, until like the early 2000s, you could use DDT to kill bed bugs. Okay, and that became a thing that people could no longer use. And um, it's not MSOE that had a bed bug problem, it was like the whole fucking world, right? And so, but MSOE eventually got hit by that. One of the difficulties with bed bugs is that they live in specifically wooden furniture, okay? Which is why the MSOE stuff is either specially treated, so we have specially treated wood that's inside uh, Veet's Tower, uh, and in MLH, it's all like metal, like furnishings and stuff like that. But before that happened, circa 2005, students were allowed to bring wood in and build whatever they wanted. So instead of 
uh, lofting their beds, you know, and buying lofts, which are approved by the university, students could do whatever they wanted. And they came up with the coolest stuff that you could come up with. So this would be an example, if I remember correctly, this is an MLH. Some people would build a deck halfway across their room and have an upstairs and a downstairs within their residence hall room, okay? And so like this guy, obviously he has his like computer, a nice CR, huge CRT up there, and like, you know, his, his living room up there and then he would sleep underneath that. And then some people like, like would, would do beds like this, some people would do them across, some people would have beds that folded down underneath. As long as it was freestanding, they could build it, okay? And so, but that was with wood, right? So obviously we have like architectural engineers here, and really smart people. So like some of the stuff they built was pretty crazy. I know one student, Josh Van Heersley, who built a triple decker in his Ooh. room. Okay, he had uh, a side, he was an RA, so it was just him in one of the rooms. And he had a space underneath and then higher, and then a space you could step up to with a middle section that he would sleep in and then a storage area underneath. And it was like amazingly cool. And they used to do like dorm, like coolest dorm room contests that RHA would usually sponsor and then go through and then everybody would kind of show off their engineering ideas and stuff. We and there have, are photos of that floating around. So. We have one apartment that is a double decker that students without our knowledge built a whole second floor in our apartment in, in Groma Tower. And we had it checked by EHS, Environment, Health, and Safety, and we still have it. And uh, it's been allowed, but the moment that the students don't want to take it over, then whoever has it last has to remove all the wood. But every year for the last nine years, it's been transferred to a group of people who are like, we want the double-decker. You know, it's one of our upper apartments, so it's a very nice apartment, but it's been turned into a double-decker, and I cannot wait to get rid of it. <laughs> you know, I just wanted it to collapse, you know. But keep going. Sure. I actually heard another story from maintenance where there was a guy who welded something and there was some kind of mechanical system that would clamp it against the walls so it wouldn't shake around. But it was still freestanding, but it had a system where it would clamp onto the walls. It was welded. Um, and they had like running electricity through conduit and stuff. Mm. And maintenance said that, you know, they had to leave it in because whenever they left, it was basically impossible to remove, even though it was freestanding. It was welded metal. And so maintenance would actually come in and replace the mattresses, and they would maintain this thing because there was no way to take it out. <laughs> and only very recently was it actually ripped out. Um, and Braden, I think you have something. I was just going to add, because my parents, the, they lived in the dorms for a few years, so they both, like, they have fond memories of, like, building wacky crap like yeah. that. And I know my mom said she had, like, one of the beds that would, like, swing down mm -hmm. and swing up in the day, and my, I think my dad had something where they built, like, a double-decker thing, too. Mm -hmm. On the topic of the conduit thing, too, my dad was saying, because, like, they only have, like, the two outlets yeah. in the dorm, they'd go down to, like, Menards or whatever hardware store it is, buy a bunch of conduit and, like, Romex <laughs> and get some outlets, and they'd just put the outlets wherever they wanted mm -hmm. in the room, because they yeah. could do that. All right, now this is where Rick's specialty comes in. This is the upper floors. Yeah. So this is the floors. Uh, you, the building was built in stages. So when we took it over, it sat abandoned for eight to uh, about eight years. Okay. From from 2008 to 20, because it was part of the, the crash. But in 20, we got it in 2013, and then it took us about a year to build out the first stage of it. So we built out the fifth floor to the ninth floor, okay? And then the next year, we added on the fourth floor and the tenth floor and the parking garage. And then after that, the third year, we added on uh, 11 through 14. So while the students were still living there, the, the ninth floor down, the tenth floor was being built. So you can imagine how loud that could be. But we only did the construction after like 9 a.m. until like 6 p.m. And then when you had the upper floors, it was the same way. But this is the upper floors, what it liked. And when my staff would have to do rounds at night, they would have to walk through this dark area and there were no lights on. So they had flashlights and they would walk through. But construction people would leave the doors open. And you can see a deck here, but on floors 11, 12, 13, there was no deck. And they would just leave the doors open to get air in because there was no air conditioning. 
and they expected my staff to reach out from 13 floors out and grab the door handle and pull it closed. And the wind would be like this, and they'd be like, and I'd be like, no, we're not doing that. And so then they, at night, the superintendent had to walk through and close all those doors. And I tried it once, and I thought I was going to die. You know what I mean? And I'm like, I'm never doing this again, you know? So Because yeah. some of those are uh, on those upper floors, there's <laughs> doors outside because there's balconies. Yeah, we had the glass balcony, but the balconies weren't there yet. Yeah. So, so it's just yeah. a little precipice that you could just. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. So this is what became Groman Tower. Um, Eckhart Groman and MSOE purchased this building that was under construction. It was originally going to be a Staybridge Suites, which would be a hotel. And so the construction stopped when the market crashed in 08, um, and it sat vacant since 2009. Um, you can see the decks up top, there's no balconies. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there was a legal battle and stuff. but. I believe the Chipotle, or the, the Qdoba that was down there was running this whole time. Yes. <laughs> yeah. well, not the whole time. It closed about two, three times when pipes broke because oh, there was no heat in the building. <laughs> and, I, and the pipes above froze and it flooded out Qdoba. And so Qdoba was shut down a good time sometimes. It was yeah. six months yeah. due to the damage that the building caused. Yeah. If any of you are AEs, you'll know that as you're building a building, you get occupancy permits for certain spaces. So very often when they do a mixed-use space, you have re you have uh, non-residential space on the ground floors, right? So Kidova went in, and they you know they had wanted some other things to go in their pizza place, which we had for a while, but that came later. Um, so. And on the side, that's the one that's on the side of the building. Those are not the ones in the front, but it's the one that you can see if you're looking down from MLH. We'll keep going. Sure. All right, so painting the dorms. You can see there's the recycle bins here. This is RWJ before it was renovated. So there were three elevator shafts, but only two of them had cars in them. So the third <laughs> one was always blocked off with these bins. We have that in the CC yeah. too, by the way. Yeah. That's my favorite. And that could have had to do with the idea of expanding the building with the wings. Um, there was a rumor online that it was filled with concrete to stabilize the building, but I don't know how true that actually was. It was not at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so back in the day, you could actually paint your hall and your building however you wanted. Um, so you can see these rooms were painted, and this was part of the RHA Best Decorated Contest. Um, this is another uh, floor where they painted on their walls. Uh, so that was kind of an interesting each, thing. Each floor used to have in, in RWJ, even more than MLH used to have their own themes so I know like the 11th floor was called the 11th hole and they kind of painted it like a uh, uh, golf theme and then there were some, like one had all car logos on it one had all like sci-fi stuff on it one had all like uh, you know all, all different kinds of, of, of different themes on it and stuff and usually what would happen is each class would add one mural each year, and so like you'd get a new, a new, a new mural or whatever. So, sure. yes, Aiden. Do you think this is something you could bring back? I do not. <laughs> no, personally, <laughs> I do not. But I. And, I, and it, it's it's really hard because what's offensive, what is not to some people, et cetera, down the line. And then the problem was the next group would come in and be like, well, we don't like Spider Man or we don't like this particular crazy design, and then. We're just spending time just repainting those, you know. So I know it sounds dumb, but it's one of those thoughts. Yeah. yeah. And actually, on the sixth floor of MLH, one of the rooms has a Mr. Peanut painted on the wall. There. So that's a, a remnant from back in the day. You know which room? I don't know the room number. <laughs> You'll have to start look at asking everyone. people. I got you yeah. my room. Up next, since I've introduced all the other directors. Betty, who's been at MSOE since 1989 and is our current assistant dean of residence life. This is something kind of cool. Uh, I'll try and get audio in it. This is from RWJ, floor four. Um, they first they found the soda machine, but then they also found this um, 
Arby's kitchen, like, <laughs> counter. So they added plumbing to it, and they had a soda fountain and a kitchen counter, and they ran a cafe out of the room that was called Cafe 404. So the resident of this room would buy groceries every single morning and cook food for people and sell it for a relatively low price. But this is kind of something that I think I was here for this because Isaiah's upkeep was the RA of this floor and he sent me this. Um, so that was something that said. Also from RWJ is the lobster. Oh. <laughs> so there was a vent that would connect the two adjacent floors in RWJ. One of the floors decided it would be funny to prank the other floor by putting a live lobster in their bed. The lobster crawled directly in between the floors and died. It decomposed over a series of weeks until it became absolutely unbearable. And Custodial had to come in and pull out this completely rotted lobster. So, that was when did that happen? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Something interesting, I guess this technically counts under residence life. This was my room in a hotel while RWJ was under renovation to Beats Tower. We had half capacity because we only had MLH Regents and a few, one floor in Groman because it was honors. Um, so we put people in uh, the hotel. Um, not much to say, I mean, it was pretty nice. I paid the same amount for an MLH dorm as this hotel room. Um, the, it's probably the, more expensive. Than the, the, yeah, probably was. <laughs> the last hall director of RWJ was Kristen Landall, who still works at MSOE as uh, the assistant director of campus life. These are some pictures from when I was at MSOE. <laughs> that was RHA Bingo. You had it cut out of Mike Lindell. That's a hallway in RWJ, and that's the old elevators before they were renovated. There's wood grain, a lot of wood trim in RWJ. Someone connected to the intercom system of RWJ and played the Soviet anthem. But these are more pictures from the lobby. There's the flap. And they had mailboxes before it was renovated, and then the mailboxes went away. <laughs> um, renovating RWJ into Beats Tower, they had a crane and what looked like a dumpster, and they lowered it down the side of the building, and then they just cut the brick out and just tore out that wall. <laughs> and that's how they actually converted it into Beats Tower. They built a staircase around the building and just cut the wall out. <laughs> so that was kind of interesting. And they completely gutted the walls and things in there. It was really just the structure of the building that was kept. Be because of how it's built, if you live in Beats Tower, you'll know that there's actually an expansion joint between the two different buildings. And then you can walk over it, and if you can actually stand in both buildings. And they both move separately just because of how the land settles and stuff like that. So uh, it was kind of necessary. So in reality, while we call it Beats Tower, you, it's actually two buildings connected. Yeah, I've tripped over the expansion going from This is a picture, some pictures I took from later um, in that process. You can see, you know, the tower starting to come up and uh, that there. This is kind of the concept art that they put together for Beats Tower. You can get the actual pictures online, so this is kind of low quality. But uh, if you can see what they had an idea for the room, it didn't really pan out. But there was some interesting ideas for that. But the actual layout of the building was basically finalized by the um, This is kind of... Uh, you know, I was there right after the grand opening ceremony, so I got one of those. Um, and construction was ongoing when the RA staff moved into the building. So this is kind of a goofy picture I got to take of that. 
And the last thing that we did with the residence halls up to this point is moving public safety over from MLH to Regents. Um, so like their main command center, you know. Um, and that happened in September of 2022, which was this school year. So that's all I have. And the public safety department is in the old uh, RWJ game room and also Roscoe's yeah. eatery. We're not, we're not going to go into a great detail, but just go back to the albums itself. Okay. Just something you can look on your own. If you look at here, we'll go slow for here. Keep sure. going down. Okay, here. The MS3 sign being installed, you can watch that. Plus, there's video on YouTube of those signs being installed. It was an all-day project. Okay. Then you keep going down. You have behind the scenes of the residents of the tower apartments. We have thousands of more photos. In our on our own Groman Tower pages, then you keep going down. You got behind the scenes of the building of the athletic field and parking complex. You got to the C building that's where we talked about, and then a bunch of students broke into the building through the construction site when they were tearing it down and took additional pictures, which is totally inappropriate. But they sent them to me, so then I said that was okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then the Throwback Thursday of the residence halls. Then there's the athletic field progress again. Throwback Thursday, the whole building of the Campus Center. Um, the Campus Center is particularly interesting because it used to be the Blatt's Brewery, of course. Right, it's all the Blatt's Brewery, so the presence of those where the brew kettles were. You look at those pictures and you can identify them. If you look at the last picture on the bottom, it's a throwback Walter Shorter Library. That's actually the concept of what the library was going to look like. But as you know, we have two U.S. presidents that have honorary degrees from MS3. One was Jerry Ford, and the other one was George Bush the first. And uh, he's, his pictures are in there because he dedicated the library on campus. Keep going down. And then we have more pictures of Walter Shorter Library. It's, it's a student surprising Dr. Veach's birthday uh, when he turned 70. Um, Dr. Veach used to have a little joke whenever Nick, he would come in and have breakfast with Nick and I at these family gatherings. Nick and I would get this big plate of bacon in front of us, right? And we'd eat this bacon. And Dr. Veach was the kind of guy who always had a salad and took the steps every place. And Dr. Veach would look over at us, and he'd be like, you know, that's going to kill you. Well, I'm not saying anything, but... We're alive, and he's not. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's our camera. I was going to say it. You'd be like, wow, Nick. <laughs> this is Nick's last year. And uh, keep going. Keep going down. And then you can see, like, 2012, the senior design project, 2010. You can see what kind of stuff that they were working on back then. And you have all these uh, these different uh, pages of uh, even 2009 commencements. Uh, so it kind of gives you an, an idea of going all the way back. Because even if you look at homecoming in 2008 and 2009, you know, when people talk about ideas for homecoming and it's coming up, it's kind of interesting to look back and say, what did we do 15 years ago? You know, and, and that's kind of interesting, you know. but. If you guys ever want, come on and give you a behind the scenes tour of uh, the Groman Tower. I'll take you up on the roof if it's a nice day like today. I'll take you up on the roof and give you guys a chance to take pictures of the entire city. They'll let you close the doors. Right. And, <laughs> and, uh, I'll show you where the bullet holes are still on our roof, you know, and all that stuff. And as you know, we had I think, like 14 windows shot out in the, in the Groman Tower in the last two years, you know, and stuff. But we still only have one bullet hole left, you know, so. It's kind of fun, yep. but you know that's the the whole bit. Any questions you guys have? It's honestly there's a lot of cool history in, in, in MS3, like those 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 booths out here, the library not booths, but the the display cases that are out here was built by a 2009 graduate, sorry, a 1999 graduate, mm -hmm. and Clint Wether and his daughter is actually coming to MS3 next year, living in the Groman Tower. But that guy could build anything, and he saw some pictures of those cabinets at like a museum at the County Historical Society, and he just built them by scratch, and then gave them to MS3, and that's where those display cases came from. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's really kind of fun to look at, you know, some of the, the cool history, you know, so. And in the library pictures, the picture of what the library used to look like before they set it all up. Aiden, cool or not? Yes. Grab another one. <laughs> all right, guys, another, we're out of here. Go. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Enjoy. I will, I will let you know that you'll be coming. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Would you go around?
talk because I don't have, do you still have any of your coins from MSWE? I do, yeah, absolutely. We'll bring in some time, but MSWE, we used to issue coins once a year to students, you know, for outstanding leadership. And they would have a different picture of a different building on the back. And these were these permanent coins that were uh, kind of neat. Now, one thing is your organization is coins are, to make them are about maybe $5 each. It's kind of cool if your historical society continues after a while, you could literally create a coin for that particular year of the historicalness of MSWE, or I'd leave the date off like we used to do, mm -hmm. and then just have the coin with this historical thing on the back. And as he's loading up, I don't mean to go over your meeting. No, you're good. It's not loading when, right now. When we good. were doing stuff here, there was an old building on campus called the C Building, right? Remember this young man, we have to get you a coin, or one of these things too. Mm -hmm. You know, and we'll show pictures of this too, but in the C building, he sat abandoned for years, and whenever MSU was throwing stuff out, we just threw stuff into this building. <laughs> well, when they were finally tearing down the building, Gary, Nick, and I, Gary, and the the library, decided to rifle through this building. There's no power, there's no nothing, right? I got as far as a little ways in, and I saw dead rats, and I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> you know what I mean? I went back upstairs to the lobby, you know? But it looked like basically a nuclear war hit or something, and everything was just abandoned. Well, we just brought back all these boxes and files. And then we hired the fraternities and we would sit up here just day after day after a weekend for hours. And we labeled what it was inside every one of these boxes. So we found all kinds of stuff. We found letters from the US presidents to our president of our college, you know what I mean? On green stationery, because only the president himself uses green White House stationery for his personal mail, right? But my favorite thing, and, and whether or not the archives kept it, I hope they did. I'm sure but they did. I'm, yeah, I hope they did. <laughs> but the archives, back in the 1950s, or during the McCarthy era and everything else, uh, McCarthy era, you had to sign a loyalty oath to MSUE as an employee. And so it said, I'm not a member of any subversive communist party thing. And uh, what do you call it? Disloyalty to America is disloyalty to MSUE and result in the immediate termination of the stuff. And I thought that, man, we should bring those back. <laughs> you know, if you're dedicated to MSUE, yeah. But if you transfer schools to UWM or something, you're dead to us. You know what I mean? Man? <laughs> But I mean, it's just funny when you think about how you read about this stuff in DC and California, but you picture this particular campus going, did you sign your loyalty oath? Yes, I did. Well, I saw you at that meeting of the Historical Society, and they were talking about some pretty subversive issues. You know what I mean? And, yeah. stuff. and I think, how cool would that have been? Not, it would have been cool back then, but looking back, you know. But. <laughs> I just started working here. I think there's some UW to drag out here. It looks like it might have. Was that UW so on defect? Yes. yes. Oh, right. Now, one thing too, if you ever get a chance. Oh, you too. And at UWM, if you ever get a chance, there's a. I went to UWM up in their library, on the very top floor. They have this thing called the it's uh, the American Geographical Society thing, but it used to be called the New York Geographical Society. They actually have some of Christopher Columbus's maps, right? And it's the world's largest collection of globes. So if you really like history, we have some really cool history in Milwaukee. And while that's still loading up, I'll tell you a quick story. In Milwaukee, we have two graduates from MSUE that uh, if you ever meet, um, and they don't live, they live in the area, but you ever meet them, they, what do you call it, uh, their grandfather is the only American official to ever meet with Hitler. Met with Hitler in July of 1941, as Hitler was trying to convince America to be our, their allies, right? And this ambassador, his name was John Cudahy, the Cudahy Tower, on the Cudahy Tower, and his father started the city of Cudahy and the packing plant, right? But he was an ambassador, three-time ambassador. Met with Hitler, and they have the articles in Life magazine, and he interviewed Hitler, and he was like, you don't have to worry about the Nazis. They just like to wear fancy uniforms and do a lot of parading around. And he had warned Eisenhower, or not Eisenhower, but he had warned Roosevelt that you just don't have to worry about it, right? Well, if you ever meet them, you are now only three degrees of separation from Hitler. Right now, I wouldn't put that on LinkedIn or anything, you know what I mean? but it's just one of those things that you could say, like, I know somebody who knew somebody 
who hung out with Hitler <laughs> and, and stuff like that, you know. But uh, uh, you know that pizza place on the south side called uh, D, the De Marini's Pizza you see in, in Bayview, that white building along 794? You know what I'm talking about? Drive 794, the bridge to nowhere, you take the bridge across to Bayview, and right by the Coast Guard station, there's a pizza place, and it says De Marini's Pizza. You know, you know what they used to be? A German POW camp soup kitchen oh in the 1940s. So I jokingly say they kept it in the Axis power because now it's Italian. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, but the thing is, is that after that it became a, a, what do you call it, an American Legion. But at that particular time, it was a German POW camp. And there was 3,000 German POWs around there. But they were not, they, were, they kept them in tents and small huts and no fence around it. But they would constantly escape and go up to Mitchell Street and drink with their German friends. And they were paid 70 cents on the dollar to work in a Milwaukee factories for the war effort. And they were granted citizenship. We had over 30,000 German POWs. Well, I was just going to say what you were just saying. A lot of German POWs loved America so much that when the war ended, they wanted to stay. So like 30,000 of them stayed like in this area. Like yeah, in this Wisconsin Wisconsin area. Alone. Yeah. So. So it's kind of fun. Milwaukee just has all this really cool kind of history, you know, that's fun to share. <laughs>